Hi, I'm Julian Frost, N3JF, and this video is an introduction to using your ICOM IC7200 on the digital modes. Today we'll be using PSK31. So I'm going to teach you how to install the drivers for your computer, how to connect your radio to your computer, and how to install the software and actually get on the air. So let's get going. Now the beauty of ICOM's design with their IC7200 is that it has a built-in sound card. That means that the only connection that you need between your radio and your computer is this USB cable. No longer do you need to buy one of these expensive interface boxes or build up your own cables. Just a $5 or $10 USB cable and you're good to go. Now the USB cable that you need is an A to B cable. The A is the flat one that you normally see on mice and keyboards. And then the B is the square one, which you might have seen on printers before. So obviously you're going to put the square plug in the square hole on the radio and the rectangular plug on the rectangular hole on your computer. But don't do that just yet. It's very, very important that you install the drivers on your computer before you connect your radio. Now we need to set up the radio for proper operation. Push and hold the set button and dial to the RF power setting. Dial the power to about 40 watts. Switch to the data mode setting and turn it on. Data mode turns off compression and sets various filters. Push and hold the set button again and dial to the MOD or modulation setting. For digital modes, we want to allow only the USB port, so we set MOD to U. We do the same for D mod or data modulation. Now adjust the USB level. I found that somewhere around 75 is a good starting point. We'll adjust this again later. Briefly push the set button again to exit the menu. To download the ICOM specific USB drivers, first open a web browser and go to www.icom.co.jp forward slash world in uppercase forward slash support forward slash download forward slash firm forward slash index dot html. Scroll down the page until you see the IC7200 section. Here it is highlighted. You'll be downloading the USB driver and driver utilities. Click on the link and double check that it is the driver for the IC7200. Click the agree button and save the file to your hard drive. Next, we need to download FL Digi, so we go to www.w1hkj.com forward slash download .html. As you can see, there are files for Windows, Linux, and OS X. We want the Windows file, so we'll click on it and save it to our hard drive. Let's open our download folder. We can see both of the files we just downloaded. This is the USB driver zip file. Let's create a new drivers folder on the desktop and extract those compressed files into this new folder. Double click, double click again, double click again, and now you can see all the files inside the compressed archive. Highlight them all and drag them with the right mouse button into the drivers folder and click copy. Close that window and open up the new drivers folder. Remember, the radio is not attached to the computer at this time. There are two versions of the USB driver, one each for 64-bit and 32-bit versions of Windows. I'm going to install the 64-bit driver by double-clicking on the 64-bit installer. I accept the agreement and click next and the silicon laboratory driver is installed. Click finish and close the window. Having installed the driver, I can now connect the radio and turn the power on. The bong sound that you hear shows that Windows has recognized the radio. Let's double check that Windows correctly installed the USB driver. Open the control panel and in the search box up here, type in the word device. 
to quickly locate the device manager. You can see it actually appears a couple of times in the list, once under System and once again under Devices and Printers. Click on the Device Manager and then click on Ports and LPT. Here we can see that the Silicon Labs USB driver was installed on COM6 in my case. It will probably be different for your computer. And now it's finally time to install FLDigi. Run the program and go through the wizard, leaving everything on this initial page set to its default. Just click Next. We can see where the program is going to be installed. The default is fine, so click Install. And it goes ahead and installs the program for us. Once it's done, click on Close. FLDigi creates two icons on the desktop. Click on the FLDigi icon to start the program and go through the initial configuration wizard. Type in your call sign, your name, your QTH, and your maidenhead locator. Also, enter a description of your antenna. You can be as detailed as you like, but I usually keep it short and simple. Click on Next and go to the Devices menu. Place a check mark in the Port Audio setting. And now, this is where it can get really confusing. Look down the list of devices under the Capture setting and select the correct USB driver. For me, it's Microphone 2 USB Audio Codec. The playback setting can be even more confusing if your computer's sound card has many different options, as mine does. Initially, you may think it's this, Windows Direct Sound Devices slash Speakers to USB Audio Codec, but it is not. Another option is the MME Devices slash Speakers to USB Audio Codec, but that is also not the right one. So be sure to double check. For me, it's simply the setting that says Speakers to USB Audio Codec. Next, we click on Settings. There's nothing we really need to change here, so we'll keep going through the submenus and click on Next. Now we're at RigCat. We're not going to be using the RigCat connection to the radio. We're going to use FLDigi's built-in Hamlib radio control. Check Hamlib and scroll down the list of radios until you find the ICOM IC7200. There it is. Remember from earlier on my computer, the USB driver was located at COM6, so that's the selection we need here. It's important to click Initialize. Although nothing appears to happen, you must click it and then click Next. Nothing on this page needs to be changed unless you want to configure something for your own personal setup. Click Finish and there you are. You can see the waterfall at the bottom, which will show the incoming signals. And you can check the program can control your radio by left-clicking the frequency up here to tune up and right-clicking to move down. FLDigi is a full-featured program, so let's do a little more configuration. We can look up call signs automatically and there are different ways of doing it. Let's configure it to use the qrz.com online lookup. Check the qrz.com button and enter in our qrz username, which is your call sign, and password. This of course assumes you have a free qrz account. FLDigi can automatically upload your logbook to eQSL. So if you have an eQSL account, type in your username and password. One thing I forgot to click here was the Send When Logged button. That will automatically upload each new contact to eQSL when FLDigi adds it to its log. Click Save and Close and you're ready to go. Let's check that our QRZ lookup is working by entering a call sign like WB6NOA and clicking on the lookup button. Here you can see the program filled in Gordon's name and location here in the United States. Now that our radio is working, let's set the operating mode to PSK31. Check the bottom left corner of the screen to confirm that it also shows BPSK31.
Correct audio levels are vital for proper operation on the digital modes. Right click the Windows speaker icon on the Windows taskbar and select Recording Devices. Click on the ICOM USB audio codec that you installed earlier and click on Properties. Click the Levels tab. Changing the slider here will adjust how much audio comes from the radio to the computer. You can see I have it set at 1 here. As I move it up and down the scale, you can see what happens to the waterfall display. This solid yellow means there's way too much audio coming from the radio. You want the waterfall to be solid blue with just a few speckles of yellow while no signals are present. On my computer, a setting of 1 is just right. Next we need to adjust the radio transmission levels. With the radio connected to a dummy load, press FL Digi's transmit and receive toggle. Cycle the radio's meter to ALC, then push and hold the set button twice. Dial through the menu settings to USB level. Adjust the USB level until the ALC meter shows just one or two bars. If we cycle the meter to output power, we can see that we're outputting about 40 watts. And again, here's the ALC meter showing just those two bars. Press the FL Digi Transmit Receive toggle again to stop transmitting. Let's see what the program actually does. You can control your radio up here and change frequencies and modes. This is the waterfall display here, where you can actually see the signals coming in. Click on View and select the Signal Browser. It opens another window that shows all the signals the radio is receiving within the selected passband and simultaneously decodes them. This signal is in red because the decoded PSK31 signal matches the text that is listed in the Find box here. This is a quick way of finding stations that are calling CQ. Now we have lots of stations coming in and being decoded in the Signal Browser. The Signal Browser has an extra feature that's very useful. If there's one station you want to decode, like this one, click on it and it will automatically tune in that station and decode it on the main screen. I can look up the station's call sign by highlighting it and then right clicking the call sign and selecting Look Up Call. I can also just double click on it and the operator's name and location is displayed. FL Digi does a great job of automatically locking onto signals. We can also look at the signal scope to look at the quality of a signal. This particular signal is not the best, but if we click on a very strong signal, you can see that the display goes strongly between the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock positions, which indicates a very clean signal. These buttons are macro buttons. Macros contain text and commands for the radio, giving you useful shortcuts. Macros are executed by left-clicking on the button, but if you right-click instead, you can edit them. Here you can see the CQ macro first sets the radio into transmit mode, then it sends CQ, 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 this is, in my case, N3JF, and so on. And at the end of the macro, it switches the radio back into receive mode. Right-clicking this macro shows you what it does. It puts the radio into transmit mode, sends the other person's call twice, then my call, and then puts the radio back in receive. The QSO macro puts the radio into transmit, sends their call and then my call, but then leaves the radio in transmit mode so that I can continue typing in my message to the other station. This macro sends the text back to you, their call and my call, and puts the radio back into receive mode. And this macro is one that I usually do edit. It says thanks for the QSO, gives their name, 73, hope to see you down the log, and then sends the date and time and the call signs. But sometimes you may want to change your sign-off text. So just highlight what you want to change, type in your changes such as see you later. You know, I'm going to leave it as it was. So I'm putting back in see you down the log. 
And then when you're done, click the apply button and that macro is now updated. Now, finally, it's time for our first QSO. So I click the CQ button and you can see it preloaded the CQ text into the buffer, which is down here in the blue area. It puts the radio in transmit mode and starts sending out my CQ. You can see the progress up here in the yellow area. Everything in red has already been sent. The macro ended and put me back in receive and now I'm looking at the waterfall and with any luck, yes, there's someone responding to my CQ. I double click on his call sign and click the lookup button and everything gets populated. Now I click on the answer macro button and it sends his call sign twice, my call sign three times and says over. Once that has all been sent, the radio is switched back into receive mode. I created my own macro, which sends his call and then my call, but does not switch the radio into transmit or receive. So here I can see what he's responding to me, and I'm able to actually start typing my message while I'm receiving the text from him. So I'll just type in, thanks for the call, George, and maybe then I'll click on the me slash QTH macro button that tells him my name, where I'm located, and my maidenhead locator. Again, none of this is going out over the air yet, because I'm still receiving his signal. Looking at the radio, I can see his signal report, so I'll type that in too. The signal scope shows his signal is excellent, and all of this is queued up, ready to send, as soon as his signal stops. Now we can see my text being transmitted. The text in the blue area is turning red as it is sent. I can't edit text that has already gone out, but I can edit text in the buffer. A little bit later in the QSO, I was watching the waterfall display when I saw this. One of the cool features of FL Digi is that you can actually send out a PSK31 signal that actually looks like text on the waterfall. So here you can see the letters CQ in the waterfall. It's easy to do with a macro command, but I'll leave it to you to find out just how it's done. It's time to finish my QSO with George, so I've pressed the SK macro button, and it has entered the date, the time, his call sign, my call sign, and SK. And then finally it switches the radio back to receive mode. And we're done. That was our first PSK31 QSO. It's important to remember that FL Digi and your IC7200 are not limited to just PSK31. Just by changing the operating mode, you can try CW, Contestia, Domino EX, Hellschreiber, MFSK, MT63, Olivia, PSK31 of course, QPSK, Ritty, Thor, Throb, it can even receive weather faxes. And nav text messages. So don't be afraid to spin the IC7200's dial and experiment. That was your introduction to using the digital modes on your ICOM IC7200. I hope you found it helpful. So for ICOM America, this is Julian Frost, N3JF73.